Good day, everyone. This is your teacher, Ms. Mars. And in today's video lecture, I am going to talk about approaches to materials evaluation. And I am going to add, I will specifically talk about standard approaches to materials evaluation. And I know this is a topic that I haven't you know, included in my previous video lectures. On this video, we are going to focus our discussion on approaches to materials evaluation. I know you all already, thus without further ado, let's begin. So as what I mentioned, standard approaches to materials evaluation. This topic is intended for the English language majors or those who major in linguistics or English language. So let's try to explore on standard approaches to materials evaluation. But prior to me talking about these approaches, I would just like to share with you, class, a backstory. You know, Tomlinson in 2013 actually shared um, his story about how everything started. Because long time ago, or it has been a while, he has actually been invited or asked to do a lot of materials evaluation by publishers, by different companies. In fact, he became a member of the National Curriculum Committees. And because he became a member of National Curriculum Committees, they were asked to actually look into or evaluate uh, the books that are going to be used in schools or the books that will be officially used in schools. So as a member of the committee, so the members, including himself, when they reviewed or when they evaluated, they just based it on their impressions, which is for him, it's not really promising, right? When you just base it on your impression. So that's why uh, to him, there is really a need to develop or to have a criteria, to have checklist or criteria on the conduct of materials evaluation. And because of that, Tomlinson 2013 was encouraged by a major British publisher to develop a comprehensive set of principled criteria prior to him conducting an of evaluation. And through, true enough, he led a team of evaluators and they developed a set of 133 criteria prior to them evaluating the eight adult EFL courses for ELT journal. You know, EFL, English as foreign language, and ELT is English language teaching. So uh, they did that, Tomlinson et al. in 2001. So they successfully created a set of 133 criteria and they evaluated. Now, many, according to Tomlinson also, many of the checklists and list of criteria that were already suggested in publications provide, yes, a useful starting point for anybody conducting an evaluation, but there are drawbacks because some of them are really impressionistic and still biased. So some of them are, you know, impressionistic. That means um, the guidelines or the checklist would allow the impressions of the evaluator to be in the system of the process of evaluation and also biased. So there is not, it's not neutral. And some of the lists that were given or that could be found or given by the publications lack coverage. They are, they lack systematicity and they lack princi uh, principles. So that's what happened. And because of it's a problem, right? So the thing is, uh, when we say approaches to materials evaluation is, we would always look at the word criteria. Why are we, or how could we approach materials evaluation? The way to approach materials evaluation is through criteria, and at the same time, through our um, checklist. Right, that's our approaches to materials evaluation, and with that, we could be able to make it standardized. Okay, so some give the impression that they could be used in any materials evaluation. Okay, 
So with a, you know, kind of checklist and at the same time with a, with a criteria that could be found and the publications, some give actually the impression that they could be used in any materials evaluation, like whatever material and evaluation that you are undertaking, you can just use that particular evaluation tool. But according to Tomlinson, it's not really okay. We should make a variety because number one, there is no such term as one model framework for materials evaluation. Why did we say that? There is no such um, one model framework for materials evaluation because the second thing that we have to consider when we conduct materials evaluation, we should always remember class that we have different intentions. Okay, there are different um, institutions or organization or probably publication who ask us to evaluate. So the environment should also be considered our intentions, our objectives, and even the principles, right? So this is, there is no such term as one model framework. So the framework used must be, must be determined by the reasons. Why do we, why have, why is there a need for us to conduct materials evaluation by the objectives and at the same time by the circumstances of the evaluation. That's according to Tomlinson in 1999. So a useful exercise for us uh, writing or evaluating a language teaching materials because our subject would focus mainly on the language teaching materials would be to evaluate the checklist and criteria list from a sample of the publications. Okay, so now we are going to try to evaluate the checklist and the criteria list. We are going to cross-examine the existing checklist and criteria list given from the publication with the ones given by Tomlinson. And the following criteria that Tomlinson gave are the following. So we have to do cross-examination. For example, you are asked to evaluate and then there are already guidelines or, or checklist um, criteria that were given to you. Do a cross-examination through these following criteria. Okay, do a cross-examination with these following criteria. Number one, is the list based on a coherent set of principles of language learning. So we have to always consider the principles of language learning. Are all the criteria actually evaluation criteria or are they criteria for analysis? Now, evaluation criteria, criteria for analysis, or when you say evaluation questions, analysis questions, were already discussed. I am going to leave on the description box the video lecture that really focused on its discussion in terms of evaluation questions and analysis questions for your reference. I am not going to delve deeper on that. And the third one are the criteria sufficient to help the evaluator to reach useful conclusions. Because number one, why are we doing or why are we conducting a material evaluation class? Is of course, we have to come up with decisions and conclusions on how, what are we going to do with the materials? Is it for uh, overhauling? Is the material good for revision? Revision or what? We have to come up with a conclusion. And our criteria should lead to that um, output or should, should lead our evaluators into that direction that they could come up with a useful conclusion. Because why does the public publishing company ask evaluators to evaluate materials? Of course, there must be something, right? Um, we want the evaluators to come up with a useful conclusions so that the company, the publishing company would use it. For example, our school or the school where you are teaching or where you are working, ask you to evaluate a specific um, module okay, that, your, uh, th that you guys created. And of course, it's to be used by the student. So when you were asked to evaluate, you have to make use of criteria or checklist. And that is our approach, right? That is how we approach materials evaluation. So because of that, we make use of the checklist and the criteria. That criteria or checklist that we use should allow us to, the, to, to reach a, a useful conclusion or decision by the end of the evaluation process. And we will recommend or endorse that to the management because there must be something that they will do with the result, right? 
And then are the criteria organized systematically? So we have to cross-examine. We are going to take a look at now the, the checklist or the criteria given to us if they are organized systematically. Example, are there categories, subcategories, which would facilitate some discrete or distinct? Uh, this, when we say distinct, is being distinct, okay? Or being um, separate entity. So distinct as well as global verdicts and decisions. Are we allowing that? Is there some sort of end um, result of the evaluation process? So that is something we have to look into. Are the criteria sufficiently neutral to allow evaluators with different ideologies to make use of them? And last, which I haven't, which I forgot to enter, is the list sufficiently flexible to allow it to be made use by not only one evaluators, but at the same time, different evaluators in different circumstances. Okay, so there should be neutrality of the um, criteria. But since according to Tim Linson, which I also mentioned earlier, that when we say, um, when we say, materials evaluation, there is no such term as one model framework because it has something to do. Our uh, evaluation tool has something to do with our reasons, our objectives, and our circumstances of conducting the evaluation, the materials evaluation. So because of that, um, that is what Tomlinson would also like to really emphasize in this topic that more useful to a materials evaluator than models of criteria list, which might not fit. What if what we see do not fit with the contextual factors of a specific evaluation that we are conducting? So he suggested, how could we develop a criteria so that it can match or they can match with the specific circumstances of a particular evaluation that we are going to undertake as evaluators? So these are now how to develop criteria for materials evaluation. And that's how we could standard, uh, that is that is now what we call as the standard. This is now the standard approaches to materials evaluation. This is how we could create approaches to materials evaluation in a standard manner. And remember class, approaches to materials evaluation is we have to make sure we, we, need, we have the checklist. We also have the criteria when we conduct an evaluation. As what I mentioned earlier about the experience of Tom Lenson, if you just base it on your impression, it's not okay. There should be guidelines. There should be checklists. There should be um, criteria that we will follow, the rubric. And it is true in any assessment or evaluation that we are going to undertake, right? So how much more when we conduct materials evaluation? So in order for us to uh, tailor, in order for our criteria become like a tailored fit, okay? It is being tailored fit to the type of materials evaluation that we are undertaking, we have to follow the procedures given by Tomlinson. So it is extremely useful to develop a set of formal criteria for use in a particular evaluation. And if we follow these steps or procedure, we could come up with a formal criteria that we can use in a particular evaluation. To use that set as a basis for developing subsequent context-specific text, demanding, well, it may be, yeah, it is rigorous, it is demanding and time-consuming, it is when we create our own criteria based on this procedure, right? But the thing is, it helps the evaluators to clarify what principles of language learning and teaching are they anchoring, you know, their basis on what is it that we are basing? Diba? An institution could have different principles of language learning and teaching that they follow. A department or, or an, a ministry or the entire country definitely has, you know, the principle. Where should we, where do we um, pattern our principles? There are so many principles. And also, 
we ensure that future evaluations, both formal and informal, will always be systematic, rigorous, and above all, principled. That's why we have to follow this procedure. Now, what are now the 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 step by step, or what are now the procedures that I am uh, talking about? Number one, brainstorm a list of universal criteria. So first, we are going to look into a universal criteria. So these are the sample questions on the universal criteria. So number one, do the materials provide useful opportunities for the learners to think for themselves? Number two, are the target learners likely to be able to follow the instructions? Number three, are the materials likely to cater to different preferred learning styles, which was already you know, discussed already in the previous video about learning styles. Are the materials likely to achieve effective engagement? Or when we say effective, you also know that already. You check on the previous videos. Developing criteria for materials evaluation. According to um, Tomlinson and Masuhara in 2013, these are the universal criteria to evaluate six current global course book. So to what extent is the course likely to so if we are evaluating a six current global course books, we could say provide extensive exposure to English in use. These are universal, huh? very universal. Engage the learners effectively. Engage the learners cognitively. Provide an achievable challenge. Help learners to personalize their learning. Okay, so um, these are, we are still under universal criteria. Now, to continue, these are other questions and they're also universal criteria based on Tomlinson and Masuhara in 2013. Help the learners to make discoveries about how English is typically used. Okay. And provide opportunities to use a target language for communication. So that could be another checklist for that. Help the learners to develop cultural awareness. Help the learners to make use of the English environment outside the classroom, like allowing the learners to um, use the language not only, not only inside the classroom, but even outside when they go to the community. And then cater for the needs of all the learners. Provide the flexibility needed for effective localization or localization. When we say flexibility needed for effective localization is that as what is mentioned earlier, speaking the target language should not just only be until the four walls of the classroom. But when students go out from the class, go outside the classroom, they should be able to use it. For example, in the Philippines, we go to government offices, we go to different institutions, we speak in English, right? Because we are expected to. And then somehow also, that has been our second language. That's why we could also communicate to tellers, to people, uh, you know, in English. And help the learners to continue to learn English after the course. Help learners to use English as a lingua franca. Help learners to become effective communicators in English. Achieve its stated objectives. So these are some of the universal criteria. And going back, when we say lingua franca, it is, when we say lingua franca, it is a type of language that is commonly accepted among the people in the community and is different with the native language. So just like in the Philippines, English is our lingua franca. It's not similar with our native language, but we speak English, okay? So we adopted English is our common language as well in order to communicate with our co-Filipinos or with people, you know, in our environment or people around us. So that is number one. We have to brainstorm universal criteria. The second one is we need to subdivide some of the criteria. Okay, so class, if our evaluation uh, materials, if our materials evaluation um would let us or would want us to, or if our objective, why are we conducting materials evaluation, we would want to come up if we need to revise or adapt the language learning materials, or maybe our purpose is to make it formal, then we really have to subdivide the criteria. Because if we subdivide the specific, uh, the criteria, 
into a that when we subdivide a criteria, we would go very specific in terms of our questions. And with that, uh, it would allow us to pinpoint specific areas that is okay for revision and adaptation. That is why we have to subdivide some of the criteria, especially if we want uh, some decisions like for revision or adaptation. So for example, are the instructions, this is just an example, huh? are the ex ex instructions succinct, meaning is it briefly and clearly expressed? And then sufficient, of course, is it enough? Self-standing, okay? So standardized, separated, sequenced, staged. So things like that. This is just an example. It's up to us. Um, how could we subdivide some of the criteria so that we can allow our evaluators to pinpoint specific aspects of the language learning materials that would be okay for adaptation or revision. Okay, and then next is monitor and revise the list of universal criteria. Actually, by the way, I haven't mentioned there are 11 steps, okay? Or, or recommendations by Tom Linson. So monitor and revise the list. Monitor the list. And we also need to revise this based on the specific questions that um, are that can be found under this. And letter A is each question, an evaluation question. Or dapat. Oh, we have to look at that up also. Does each question only ask one question? Okay, so example, is the book likely to be attractive to your students? Is it suitable for the age of your students? Are your students likely to enjoy using it? Okay, so this is a specific or one question only, but let's take a look into a an example that is multiple, that, you know, an example that you can draw not one answer, but a lot of answers from the question. Example, do illustrations create a favorable atmosphere for practice in reading and spelling by depicting realism and action? This is pretty much complex. This one is okay. Does each question only ask one question so that as evaluators, we know what to focus on? And then, does the book provide attractive, interesting, or so many, so many variables that we are looking at into this question? So this is not okay. Monitor and revise the list of universal criteria and make sure is each question an evaluation question? Does each question only ask one question? Next, is each question answerable? Maybe it's really not answerable. So how can the evaluator evaluate the material? For example, is it culturally acceptable? This is not, um, is, does it achieve an acceptable balance between knowledge about the language and practice in using the language? Does the writer use current everyday language and sentence structures that follow normal word order? So sometimes questions need really the knowledge or the expertise of our evaluator that they should really know about that specific uh, context, no? Or we need um, answered from the reference of other criteria. So example here, is it culturally acceptable? What makes it um, pretty much really a, a bit needs the reference of other criteria or somehow the expertise or the knowledge of the evaluator is, this is relative. And does it achieve an acceptable balance between knowledge about the language and practice and using the language? Oh, it again needs expertise. Does the writer use current everyday language and sentence structures that follow normal word order? Well, this is answerable, obviously. It's just that there are some questions that definitely needs to be referred to the previous criteria and at the same time needs the expertise of the evaluator. But nevertheless, these are answerable. Next, monitor and revise the list of universal criteria for letter D. Is each question free of dogma? I mentioned to you already about, I think I haven't yet, so sorry. So when we say dogma or dogmatic criteria is that it means it is a type of criteria that is really rich in terms of principles set by the authority and that is controvertibly true. So when we say dogma, it is, um, it is a set of principles, you know, we base it. It is a set of principles that is, of course, laid down by the authority and that is incontrovertibly true. 
which means incontestable and free from questions. So you just follow it because it's free from questions. So for example, the following examples make assumptions about the pedagogical procedures of course books, which not all course books actually follow. So that's why it should not have a question that is dogmatic or the criteria should not be dogmatic. Are the various stages in a teaching unit, what would you probably call presentation practice and production adequately developed? Do the sentences gradually increase in complexity to suit the growing reading ability of the student? So is you have to consider this. This question should be free of dogma. Next, um, is each question reliable in the sense that other evaluators would interpret it in the same way? For example, each of the following questions could be interpreted in a number of ways. You know, number one, are the materials sufficiently authentic? Is there an acceptable balance of skills? Do the activities work? Is each unit coherent? So remember, it should be reliable in the sense that evaluators would also have unison in their interpretation in some way. Though not really 100%, but at least it is the majority. Next, it is each question reliable in the sense still? These are still the other um, questions. There are a number of ways in which the question above could be rewritten. You know, so that it could pass into this specific um, criterion under criterion three. So it could be, are the communicative tasks useful in providing learning opportunities for the learners? And are the activities in each unit linked to each other in ways which help the learners? Okay, that is how could we rewrite it. Next, number four, categorize the list. So it is really useful to categorize the universal criteria in order for us to have focus in class that we categorize the list in order for us to facilitate focus and enable generalizations of the list. So possible categories for universal criteria would be we will categorize it under learning principles. We categorize it perhaps under cultural perspective, topic content, teaching points, text, activities, methodology technology, instructions, design, layout. And we have to develop media-specific. We say develop media-specific criteria class. We look into the relevant develop media-specific criteria. We have to create a specific criteria that has of relevance to the type of materials that we are evaluating. For example, if we are evaluating books, are we evaluating audio materials? Are we evaluating video? Are we evaluating uh, magazines, journals? So that's why examples of such criteria would be, is it clear? which sections the visuals refer to? Is the sequence of activities clearly signaled? Are the different voices easily distinguished? Do the gestures of the actors help to make the language meaningful in realistic ways? Next, we have to develop content-specific criteria. So make sure, class, that the criteria that we created are relevant with the topics and the focus or the subject or the content of the materials that we are evaluating. So for example, do the examples of business texts, examples, letters, invoices, replicate features of real life business practice. Next, do the reading texts represent a wide and typical sample of genres? We don't actually create a criteria that is not relevant or that is not related to the genre of text that we are evaluating or to the genre of the materials that we are evaluating. So it should be of relevance. And the next, develop age-specific criteria. We have to make sure that our criteria are relevant or related to the age groups of the language learners. So, for example, there should be a criteria intended for maybe 5 to 10 years old or 10 to 15. So, depend, it depends on the materials and the, uh, and the materials, where should it be or to whom is it made for? So the examples for age-specific criteria would be, are there short, varied activities which are likely to match the attention span of the learners? Is the content likely to provide an achievable challenge in relation to the maturity level of the learners? Like criteria, we relate to the actual or potential environment of use of the said uh, materials that we evaluated. So for example, uh, before we look into the examples of the criteria, we have to look at first the specific set of materials that probably needs this. No? Typical features of the environment which would determine this set of materials are 
Uh, these are here are the typical features of the environment which would determine this set of materials are the types of institutions, resources of the institutions, the class size, the background needs and wants of the learners, the background needs and wants of the teachers, the language policies that are in operation, the syllabus. So we have the objectives of the courses, the intensity and extent of the teaching time available. What is our target examinations? The amount of exposure to the target language outside the classroom. And we have here some examples of local criteria that would be to what extent are the stories likely to interest 15 year old boys in Turkey. So that is why we have to um, make it localized. No? Or if that is in Turkey, but what if it's in the Philippines? So to what extent are the stories likely to interest 15 year old boys in the Philippines or five year old boys in the Philippines? To what extent are the reading activities likely to prepare the students for the reading questions in the primary school, leaving examination in Singapore? To what extent are the topics likely to be acceptable to parents of students in Iran? So the ninth is develop other criteria. So other criteria, which might be appropriate to develop could include teacher specific, administrator specific, gender specific, culture specific, L1 specific criteria. And in the case of review for a journal, we could look into a criteria that allows assessing the match between the materials and the claims made by the publishers for them. So in this case, it's the evaluator, it's us already who is develop, it's us who are developing the criteria who could identify because there might be uh, instances where our administrator or where the school would ask us the specification. So we have to develop other criteria. Then trial the criteria. The next procedure is now we have already the criteria. It is important to trial the criteria class even prior to a small and fairly informal evaluation so that we could have to ensure that the criteria are sufficient and serable, reliable, and useful. Kumbaga, this is pilot testing. Revisions can then be made before the actual evaluation begins. So if uh, we do this, then we are pretty much sure that when we do the actual evaluation, we could say that our criteria, our checklists are already perfect or they really serve their purpose. And the last, of course, is conducting the evaluation. So now we have already revised and we are sure already our criteria. So now we conduct the evaluation that we need to undertake of that specific material. So from experience, Tomlinson has found the most effective way of conducting an evaluation is to make sure that there is more than one evaluator, okay? discuss the criteria to make sure there is equivalence of interpretation. Not that, okay, you give the tool to the evaluator, but there is no orientation. You should orient the evaluator. What do these criteria mean? What do these categories mean and such? Answer the criteria independently and in, in, in isolation from other evaluators so that you won't have any opinion coming from the other evaluators influence you and focus in a large inval evaluation on a typical unit for each level, and then check its typicality by reference to another unit. And give a score for each criterion, write comments at the end of each category so that they would know why you um, evaluated this way, why your score is like this. At the end of the evaluation, aggregate each evaluator's scores for each criterion, category of criteria and set of criteria, and then average the scores. And then record the comments shared by the evaluators and write a joint report. And then that's it. When you write a joint report, that means you that is already okay for submission to the person asking for that evaluation report. And for more informal, however, for more informal ev evaluations or when very little time is available, actually Tomlinson recommend the following procedure. Number one, brainstorm beliefs, desired and shared beliefs, convert the shared belief, beliefs into universal criteria, write a profile of the target learning context for the materials, develop local criteria from the profile, evaluate, revise the universal and the local criteria, and boom, conduct the evaluation. And here are, by the way, the references that I used for this video lecture. And I hope you learned a thing or two. Thank you very much for watching. And I hope uh, class you 
learn, you know, a lot from my lectures and I have been receiving comments from you. Thank you so much. If I don't give you a response right away, please don't use it against me. I also have other things to do, but I really want to make sure that whenever I check your comments, I really reply as soon as possible. So thank you very much, everyone. And I will see you next time. Take care, everyone. Be safe. Bye-bye.